anxious mind, nor have an anxious mind. You know, highlight that. For all these things, the nations of the world, not only do they seek after, they're seeking after right now. And your father, but your father, watch this, but your father knows what you need. He knows that you need these things. But rather what you should do is seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. You already highlight this word here or this phrase, do not fear, little flock, <laughs> for it is your father's ooh, I love it, good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, what was Jesus referencing in the text? Worry and their anxiety. What were they anxious about? Their provision. So not only, and he addresses the provision. He tells them, the father knows what you have need of. Don't fear, little flock. For it's the father's good pleasure. It's the father's heart. It's the father's desire to give you the kingdom. And in the kingdom, your provisions are taken care of. And not only that, the kingdom that he's given you is an unmovable, immovable. It doesn't run out. There's no shortage of supply. It's unshakable. So not only is it unshakable, it accounts for your provision. Now, let's go a little deeper. One of the reasons, or another reason, one, it's unshakable because he's the king and he's an unshakable king. But another reason that the kingdom is unshakable is because it's anchored in its king's boundless grace. Write that down. Watch this. I got some more to add to that. It's anchored in the king's boundless grace and unshakable counsel. We'll give you some time to write that down. All right, we can all be students today. You can high five the person next to you, but we can all be students today. We're going to walk this. It's, it's anchored. So, so, so another reason that it's an unshakable kingdom is because it's anchored in its king's boundless grace and unshakable counsel. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. So we're going to start at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 7. Now, y'all stay with me. You know me. I'm going to, I flood you with scriptures and verses. I need you to go and you look at it yourself and, 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 and study this thing. But watch this. There's some things, some words I want to point out that's going to validate that statement. The kingdom is anchored in its king's boundless grace, limitless grace, his overreaching grace. You, want to talk, you, want to, you understand what I'm talking about in a minute? And his unshakable counsel. And it's in the text. <clears throat> verse 7, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. Watch this. Now this is according to. So the redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of its sins is not based upon any merit of your own. It's really just tied to the faithfulness of our king and his boundless grace. What do you mean? Well, he says it's according to the riches of his grace. In all wisdom and prudence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. According to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us. So everything he's done for us, this redemption, it is according to, it's in line with the riches of his grace, which he made, he made this abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, and all under, I love this, in all practicality and understanding. Okay? Now, the word abound is where I want to deal with for a second, because the word abound, it means to lavish or to properly to exceed, to go beyond the expected measure. 
It means to go above, above and beyond. You know, somebody tell you, man, you went above and beyond with this. I had an expectation, but then you went above and beyond this expectation. It means, watch this, to, to what goes further more, what surpasses or what exceeds the ordinary or the necessary. It means to overflow. What does it mean? It means that God, when he, when, he, when he manifests himself, when he shows up, when he does things, or what he's done for us, he always exceeds the ordinary and the necessary. When he invades and manifests himself in our life, he always goes above and beyond our expectation. Uh, here's one. God is able, I prove it in text, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But now notice this, and I believe the enemy understands this too, according to the power that works where? Within you. Now I need you to understand, body, body of Christ, I need you to understand something. There's a few things that are working in you that the enemy is trying to drive out of you. And that is, first of all, the kingdom of heaven is where? Within you. That unshakable kingdom. Jesus says, don't look here or there. Don't look for observations or signs. It, it ain't out there. The kingdom is within uh, you. Another thing that's, another person that is within you is the person of the Holy Ghost. So you got the person of God. You got the power of God. You got the anointing of God, and then you got the unshakable kingdom of God all abiding within you. That's what God said concerning your life, concerning for every believer, every child of God. That's what he said. But I have a question for you. Do you know what's working in you? Because the enemy trying to get something else to work in you. And it's called fear. But what we should have working on the inside of us is the counsel of God. I have a thought. Remember, just to, just to talk about the, how God goes um, above and beyond. Y'all remember the widow woman at Zarephath? She was in the midst of a famine, gathering sticks to have her last meal with her son and then die. Now, she was completely unaware that God was speaking to a prophet, the prophetic one that was carrying the prophetic voice of God, the word of God for the land, for the nation. And so God speaks to him and says, hey, look, I want you to go over uh, to, to I want you to go over to the city. Zarephath. There's a widow there. And I've watch this. I've commanded. I, I spoke. I told her to do something that's contrary to her situation. She's in a famine. The land is in crisis. But I've commanded her. To feed you. Uh, this is the amazing part about this, that when God actually shows up through his prophet, watch this, and invades her life, the prophet says to her, fix, he says, what are you doing? She said, I'm gathering these sticks. I'm going to go home, fix a meal. Me and my baby, we're going to eat this, and this is our last meal. We're going to die because we have nothing else. The crisis has overtaken us. <clears throat> we don't have anything. And, and, and so the prophet says, okay, I'll tell you what, fix me a little bit first. Fix me a little bit first and then go do what you said you were going to do. Fix me a little morsel of bread first and, and watch this. And then she does it. And he says something in the text that really blessed me. He said, fear not. That if you respond to the voice of God, he says, your flour and your oil will not run out. And so here... In the midst of this famine, God commands her. He invades her life through the person of the prophet. When he invades her life, notice what he does. He goes above and beyond. He didn't just give her enough to fix a meal. He gave her enough to carry her throughout the famine. I love God. Because neither famine or crisis can limit, y'all ain't hearing me, what God has purposed to do when he shows up. He purposed to do that in her life. I commanded her to feed you. So it doesn't matter what's happening. When God has purposed to do something, nothing can limit God when he shows up. 
Now, there's another word. I'm going to go back to Ephesians 1. I just wanted to drop that nugget on you. I want you to think about that. Keep that in your heart during this time when you're running short, even on toilet paper. <laughs> Come on, somebody. If he, can, if he can make sure her meal don't run out, he can make sure that your toilet paper don't run out. Come on, somebody. I know, look, you might be laughing. I'm serious. Y'all know you're getting low. You got a couple rows. Hey, Lord, look, I'm commanding. I'm ready to do something. I need to sow one to get four. What do I, what I need to do? <laughs> All right. There's another word here in the text I want to deal with. Ephesians 1, it goes on uh, verse 9. Watch this. We continue it. It says, <clears throat> having known unto us, so he, 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 he lavishly uh, extends his grace to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. In him, wait a minute, wait a minute, before we read verse 11, let me deal with the word dispensation because it will help put things in perspective so that you can remain sober and sound because let me help you out. Uh, your life, things aren't out of control. It's only out of control if you lose control. And that's what I mean about this, meaning in your mind. Things aren't out. It's not out of control. It might be out of your ability to do something about it, but it ain't completely out of control. It might be out of your parameters, your abilities, uh, your skill or your resources to do something, but it's not out of control because there's one who is always in control. And this word dispensation gives us insight into this. What do you mean? Well, dispensation means <clears throat> the divine ordering of the affairs of the world. Now, our text says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather. Dispensation also means, in the Greek, it signifies primarily a stewardship, the management or disposition of affairs entrusted to someone. What that means is that we are under the stewardship of God. The earth is the Lord's, not just the church, not just, you know, saints, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and all that dwell therein. The word dispensation lets us know that we are under the stewardship of God. It means that God is in control. Come on, shout yes. God is in control. He is still stewarding our affairs. Listen to me. He has not forgotten about his people. I'll give you one. In Isaiah 49, 14 through 16, God told, just write the verse down. I'm going to read it really quick. God told Israel, this is what he said to Israel. <clears throat> he said, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. He says, see, oh, I love that. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I know it may look shaky, but watch this. But we are in and under the sovereign hand and management of God. I'm going to say it again. We are in and under. We are in and under the sovereign hand and management of God. And we got to get this because it will keep us postured and submitted. To the care of God, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Okay, look. Look at verse 11. It said, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinate, be predestined, preplanned. We've been preplanned according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. 
I love this. He works all things. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. And I'm glad he works after the counsel of his own will because the will of man is shaky. It's limited. It's predicated upon happenings. It's limited in knowledge. And also the frailty of mankind. But the counsel of God is resolved. It's fixed. It is settled in heaven. <laughs> I thank God that he's working off of what he preplanned. And I thank God that it's unshakable. What do you mean? Well, the word counsel here in this text, it, watch this. It means a resolved plan. Particularly of the immutable aspect of God's plan. It means a resolved, unchanging plan. Yeah. Purposefully arranging all physical circumstances, which guarantees every scene of life works to his eternal purpose, to his eternal plan. Somebody say it's already resolved. Listen, Corona is not determining the outcome of this thing. It's already resolved. Well, my life is. My life is already resolved. Are y'all hearing me? You ought to be telling somebody your life. It's already resolved. God resolved his plan before he pressed play. Are y'all hearing me? His word is already settled. That means that whatever we face in this life does not alter what he's already resolved. I told you last week, God doesn't carry it like his pen, his pencil doesn't have an eraser on it. He already resolved it. That means that anything that happens in time, God already accounted for it. Come on, somebody. And if you're in the kingdom of God and under his sovereign care and hand, there's nothing for you to be anxious about. All you need to do is seek the kingdom because all of your provision is in the kingdom of God, and that kingdom is unshakable because it's attached to the resolved, the already finished, unshakable counsel of God. There's no situation that arises or happens that God says, wait a minute, that caught me off guard. I didn't account for that. No, God, listen, the Bible says that my days were written in his book. Are y'all hearing me? Before I ever got here. And God knew that I would be birthed in this particular season, in this particular dispensation. He understood that yes, Tyrone will be under my management at this hour, and I've already counted for every crisis, every circumstance, every shortage, every situation, but you got to be able to spend some time on your knees and, and some time in your word so that you can learn about what he already resolved. Somebody say, I'm anchored. Amen, Walls. You know, you, you preachers used to do that, right? I'll speak to, now you really got to speak to the walls. <laughs> Psalms 33 and 11 says this, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. The word standeth there means, not only does it mean abide or continue, but I love this, it means to be employed. The counsel of the Lord is employed and it stands forever. It's activated. <laughs> it's established. It remains. The word forever means without end. So the thoughts, the imaginations, the intentions, the purposes, the plans of his heart, the deepest innermost feelings of God toward all generations still stand. His kingdom is unshakable because his counsel is unshakable. And this is why, let's go back to the beginning text, right? Why gratitude? You shouldn't even have that question now. This is why we are to take the posture of gratitude because this posture of gratitude in turn is a posture of humility and a posture of great power because it lifts us up out of the pit that crisis tries to place us in. Psalm 16 and 7 says this, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before my face because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. 
Another translation says, I know the Lord is always with me and I will not be shaken for he is at my he for he is right beside me. So listen, I have to guard my heart. I have to protect my frame of mind in the night and dark seasons of life. I have to continue to operate in the instructions of God's unshakable counsel. You want to know why? Because joy is coming. I'm going to say it again. Joy is coming. Now, for all the doomsday folks, I'm not knocking. I'm just telling you that I listen, I'm operating according to the resolve plan of God. And if it is a doom, I'm still fine. I'm still covered because I'm going to be with the father. Are you hearing me? So joy is still coming. Situations don't determine or dictate my joy. Any situation. That's why if you don't know Jesus, you need to know him now. If you have not given your life to Christ, you need to know him now because you're going to be covered either way. If we're here, we're covered. If, we, if we're sick and we recover, we're covered. And if guess what? If we're going out of here, then to be absolutely with the body, absent in the body is present in the Lord. So I'm covered either way. Joy is coming. Come on, say it with me. Joy is coming. Well, apostle, how do you know? Simple. Because God is faithful. Well, I was a little high pitched on that one. <clears throat> so mind you can help me out. Faithful. Get a little bass in your voice. Faithful. God is faithful. I'm sorry. I'm excited about the word. I'm excited because God is faithful. Say it with me. God's faithful. Now, let's examine this statement for a moment. Hebrews and 11. Hebrews 11 and 11. Hebrews 11 and 11. Watch this. Powerful truth in this text. It says, by faith... Also, Sarah, herself barren, received power for the conception of seed. Your translation may say, even though she was past childbearing years. Mine says, even beyond the opportune age. She received power for the conception of seed, even beyond the opportune age. Hey, let's take that back. Remember, I told you when God invades your life, he always goes, he always uh, goes above what? Expectation. He waited. Sarah's old here, but she received power uh, to to give birth even beyond the opportune age because God always exceeds what is normal. So she received power beyond opportune age since she considered the one having promised faithful. She considered him faithful. I say faithful. Listen, faithful here in the text. It means loyal. Constant. She considered God loyal to what? His promises. She considered God constant, steadfast. She considered God. I know I'm old, but you're unchanging. I know I'm old. I know my body's uh, my body's past that 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 season, God. But but you are unmovable. If you say something, you won't be moved. You're gonna stick to what you said. You're gonna stand on what you said. You place your word above your name. She considered him. Watch this constant. She considered him. The word faithful means dedicated. He's it means committed. It means trusty, trustworthy, dependable, reliable. It means accurate. It means precise. It means exact. It means errorless. He's unerring. He's faultless, true, close, strict, realistic, authentic, on the mark and on the money. She considered God to be on the money. Listen, the faithfulness of God, y'all ready, is guaranteed in the fact that God will never be inconsistent with himself. Oh, you ought to shout right there. Listen to me. The faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of God is guaranteed in the fact that God will never be inconsistent with himself. Understand, watch this, that God will never cease to be what he is and who he is. Write that down. God will never cease to be what he is and who he is. Now, Hebrews 11 and 6 says it this way. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. <laughs> and I love that. It just say he is. Watch this. 
Hear me when I make this statement. Everything God says or does must be in accordance with his faithfulness. Everything God says, everything God does must be in accordance with his faithfulness. He will always be true to himself. He'll always be true to his works. He will always be true to his counsel. He will always be true to his kingdom. Y'all ain't hearing me. He will always be true to his creation. The faithfulness of God guarantees that God will never cease to be who and what he is just as his immutability guarantees that. He's unchanging. I want you to hear me when I say this. If God changed in any way, I heard this years ago, he'd have to change in one of three directions. He will have to go from better to worse, from worse to better, from one kind of being to another. Now, because God is absolutely holy or absolutely perfectly holy, he couldn't change from worse to better. God being that, God being God and not a creature, could not change the kind of being that he is. His perfection secures this. God's faithfulness also secures it because God can never cease to be who he is and what he is. Now, why is this important? Because it's behind this revelation that Jeremiah makes his declaration. I want you to go with me to Lamentations. Some of y'all already know this. It's in your heart. I want you to go to Lamentations chapter 3, looking at verse 21. I want to read this. This is the revelation we have to, we have, to have. Listen, this word will help you when you say, God, I, don't, I can't see you. I don't know, but I know you're still working. Why? Because I know you're faithful. <laughs> God, I can't feel you, but I know you're still there. And you're still working because you're faithful. God, I might not be able to hear you, <clears throat> but I thank you for your word because you've given me enough testimony to go back to. Y'all ain't hearing me. Come on, you've been, you might have been spending time on your knees and saying, man, I can't hear anything. Well, then my question is, won't you go back and see what you can see? Get in that word. Let God cr crack that thing open. Get some revelation. I believe God is also trying to use time like this to get us rooted and anchored in the testimonies of the Lord because that's how you overcome anyway by the blood of the lamb and your testimony watch this look at what look at the testimony of Jeremiah and it might encourage you Lamentations 3 verse 21 says this I recall where to my mind somebody said I gotta be sound watch this he said this I recall to my mind Therefore, I have hope. Why? Because I recalled it. I went back to the testimony of the Lord. I brought this back up, what God already did. And, and, and watch this. He says, so therefore, I have hope. <clears throat> Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new. What? His compassions are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So he says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope, but I don't just have hope. I hope in him. To the soul. He goes and says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. What did we just say? The Lord is good for those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him. Then verse 31, if I jump down to it, it really encouraged me. It says, for the Lord will not cast off forever. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to read it from New Living Translation really quick. It says, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. <clears throat> it's not going anywhere. His mercies 
never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him and to those who search for him. Come on, somebody shout, he is faithful. The writer's writing during a time of calamity. The nation of Israel was turned upside down. They were brought to captivity. And now Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. But in the midst of his weeping, he reminds himself of who God is and that God cannot be inconsistent with who he is. And so he turns his mind back and he gets hope in the fact that God is faithful. I shared this with someone the other day. I said, you want to live a full life? Build everything you have on the faithfulness of God. Build everything you have on the faithfulness of God. Come on, beloved. I need you to get this, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I need you to be prepared to suddenly come out of this thing. Hear me when I say this. I need you to be prepared to suddenly come out of this thing. Why? Because of what verse 31 says, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Why? Because he's faithful. Go with me to Psalms 30, verse 5. Watch this. This is a verse that we often quote, but we leave out the most important part of the verse. It's the start. We normally start off by saying, weeping man do it for a night, but joy cometh. But you got to read the first part of the verse. Look what the first part says. Y'all ready? Watch this. For his anger is but for a moment. Now we can read the rest. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. (laughs) Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. One translation says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Aren't you so glad his mercies are renewed? They start afresh. They begin new every day. You might have squandered yesterday, but if you opened your eyes, if God blessed you to wake up this morning, there's time for you, watch this, to hear his voice and harden not your heart. There's time for you to repent and get your mind back in line with the word and the counsel of God. For his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Why? Because his mercies are renewed every morning. Are y'all hearing me? This is the revelation that you have to nurture. This is where everything suddenly changes because it's what you nurture at night that postures you and puts you in the right frame of mind for the new day. How many of y'all miss the mercies of God this morning? You got up complaining about yesterday. You got up worried about yesterday. You got up worried about today. And it took your mind off of the mercies of God. You missed the joy of God. But I'm going to tell you right now, hopefully you're getting it right now. Hopefully it's hitting your heart right now. And you're putting your mind back where it needs to be because you have an unshakable kingdom. That's rooted and grounded in the unshakable counsel of God that accounts for your provisions. And I'm telling you right now, you might have been in a state of weeping and it endured. It might have stayed the night. You know, some of you asked a sleepover. One translation said it stayed the night. Well, you kick that joker out when you get up. I don't need that kind of company. Psalms 42 and 8 says this. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night. Watch this. His song will be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. Can I share a revelation with you? It comes out of Isaiah 51 and 16. The scripture says, and I have put my words in your mouth and I have covered you in the shadow of my hand. Oh, there the hand again, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people. Listen to me. We have to hold on to his song in the night. 
for in it is the testimony of the Lord. What are you talking about? He has put his word in our mouth, meaning he has given us his testimonies. Think about this. This is a revelation God gave me. He said, Tyron, what do you do? Hold on to, to the testimony of the Lord. Hold on to what I've already done in your life. Hold on to what I've decreed. Hold on to, to who I've manifested myself to be in your life. He says, I need you to hold that. And I don't need you just to hold it in your mind. I need you to hold it in your mouth. Why? He says, because your heart should instruct you in the night season. You should sing. Hold on to my song. Why, God? He says, well, because watch this. He says, it's the testimony of who he is. Y'all remember that? And what he has declared that becomes our song song and our prophetic utterance. Yes, it's our song. Our song becomes a prophetic declaration that always precedes his manifestation. I'm going to say it again. Our song becomes a prophetic declaration that precedes his manifestation. Why? Because it's in your song and your gratitude in the night that gives way to revelation that provides the womb that conceives in faith and gives birth to breakthrough. I'm going to say it again. That was a lot to say. It's your, it's, your, it's your song and your gratitude in the night. That's why you got to keep your gratitude. That gives way to revelation that provides the womb that conceives in faith. Come on, Sarah. And gives birth to breakthrough. And breakthrough is always suddenly. Yes. Weeping may endure for a night, but I prophesy joy is coming. Why? Because he is faithful. I'm going to close with this thought. Hear me now, church. I need you to really hear me. Because we have a song that we can sing. We are a part of this kingdom. We are a part of this kingdom. Watch this. I want you to hear me in this. As long as I can see the moon at night, I have proof that there's a sun out there somewhere, and I have proof that the morning's coming. Are y'all hearing me? As long as I can see the moon at night, I have proof that the sun is out there and the morning is coming. Watch this. And this is why it is critical for the people of God to arise and shine in this hour. Because as long as they can see a reflection of his light, there is proof that the sun is out there. The S-O-N. And guess what? Morning is coming. So I want to challenge you guys. In this time, don't stop sowing seeds of righteousness in the night. And this is why. Because there's a day to everything that you've sown in the night. What you sow in this season will not be in vain. And I ain't talking about money. I'm talking about your actions. I'm talking about your faithfulness. I'm talking about your words. I'm talking about you having the right attitude and the right heart. I'm talking about you being a light when everybody else is operating in panic and fear. They need to see the moon. They need to see the moon at night. They need to see a reflection of the sun at night because it gives them hope that, says, that morning is coming. And if morning is coming, joy is coming. What you sow in this season will suddenly come up. It will come suddenly. According to Isaiah 43 and 8, watch this. The, the text says, suddenly he will make it happen. That, that, it said, Isaiah 48 and 3 says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. Remember, from my resolved plan, I, I, I said these things from the very beginning. This, this didn't catch me off guard. I already prophesied. I already spoke. I already, listen, I already have the date. I already have the time when things are going to change. And God says, I've already, I spoke that beforehand. And then he goes on to say this. He says, they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them. I did them suddenly and they came to pass. 
One translation says, long ago I announced what I was going to, he said, what was going to be. Then without warning, I made it happen. The good news translation says, the Lord says to Israel, long ago I predicted what would take place. Then suddenly I made it happen. You are still under the administration and the faithful stewardship of God. We need to be prepared for this sudden harvest. Are you hearing me, church? I'm talking about a harvest of souls. I'm talking about a harvest. We need to be prepared for a sudden harvest because God is doing things in the hearts of people that are suddenly going to come up. This is why you got to keep sowing those seeds of righteousness. You got you to keep being the light. You got to keep, listen, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You got to keep sharing the word of the Lord. And I ain't talking about, I'm talking about do it like Jesus. Don't walk around here. You just want to preach gloom and doom. It's by the grace and the mercy of God that you are saved. You need to go out there, share the truth, no doubt. Tell them the truth, no doubt. But it needs to be in love. Arise and shine. And operate by the unshakable counsel of God. Let me read this text and Tim can come and we're going to close out. I'm going to read this text. I'm going to give a call to salvation. We're going to close out with a song of worship because I just think we need to respond to the faithfulness of God. Isaiah 60. Prayerfully, you guys are blessed right now. You've been blessed with this word. Isaiah 60. Watch this. I'm going to read verse 1 and 3, church. I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you to capture this, to posture yourself, be sober and sound, because it's our time to arise and shine in the night. Don't be overcome by the darkness, because you are the moon that should reflect the light of the sun. Are you hearing me? Listen, Isaiah 60 verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, look, see, the darkness shall cover the earth. And deep darkness, one says gross darkness, the people. But the Lord in the midst of this, the Lord will arise over you. Just like the sun does at night when it hits the moon, the Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you. His light that is shining will be seen upon you. For the Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Church, it's time to arise and shine. For your light has come. You've been looking for the darkness to be removed. All I need is the sun to shine on me. And as long as there's the sun and I'm reflecting and I know joy is coming, I know day is coming, I know the mercies of God are coming because they renew every day. And I know all of that is anchored in the unshakable counsel of God because my king, my God is faithful. Now, listen, if you're here today, I want to give this call. If you're here today and, and I'm talking about here, if, you, if you're online right now and you have not given your life to Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to do so. He loves you. God said he would that none would perish. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. So right now, if you just pray, Father, if you just say, Lord, you say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost without you. And I just need you to save me. I give you my life. I give you all that I am. I surrender to your Lordship. Now, Lord, respond to me in your faithfulness. The preacher just said that you are faithful. And so I turn to you right now. And I'm asking you, God, save my soul and receive me into your kingdom. Because everything around me is shaken, but you, oh God, he just said you're unshakable, you're immovable. So Lord, save me in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer, what I want you to do is in the link in the description for this stream, it says, there's a link that says, I've decided, I think it says, I decided to follow Jesus. I want you to click on that. It's going to take you to a page. It's going to talk about what just took place in your life. 
And then I want you, there's a section there that says, we want to hear all about it. We want you to fill your name out. We want you to submit it. And somebody, one somebody from our ministerial team and the staff will contact you and help you so that you'll know what the next steps are. Amen? Now, if you know Jesus and you're already born again, what I want you to do is I want you to worship with us as we close out with this. Because he is beautiful. <laughs> he is faithful. And one look will change your life forever. One look will lead to your suddenly. So worship with us right now. And then we're going to let you go. We love you.